Meghan and Harry don't really do family, do they? In the past, Prince Harry has poured scorn on King Charles's skills or lack thereof as a father. And in this latest documentary series, he's made a sly dig at his brother William by implying that his wife, Kate, fits some kind of mould, that she ticks boxes or something. God knows what he was actually saying. But he may have a point. If Kate is in a mould, she's in the mould of a nice wife who gets on with her husband's family. Is that too much to ask? We've all got to make it work with the in-laws, don't we? And it's not always easy. It's my view that Kate is in the mould of a dignified woman who is humbly fulfilling her role as wife, mother and princess of Wales, representing her family and serving the nation. Harry seems to go for partners who indeed do not fit the mould. Don't get me wrong, Meghan Markle is a stunningly beautiful, intelligent and charismatic woman who many thought and hoped was the next Diana. But what has emerged is a self-absorbed narcissist living in a parallel universe with her own version of the truth, like the fiction of the date of their wedding, to give but one example. Harry and Meghan don't do family when it comes to her side either, with the couple famously dumping poor old Thomas Markle, not even visiting him when he had a heart attack, and of course uninviting him from their own wedding. Samantha Markle, Thomas Markle Jr., they've all been cancelled by this pair. You'd think, wouldn't you, that Harry's protective instincts towards his family would at least surface in relation to our great Queen Elizabeth II. He may have resentment towards his brother or his father. Fair enough. Families are complicated. But as the Queen battled ill health in what turned out to be the final months of her life, and as she grieved her beloved Philip, Harry was quite happy to do podcasts slagging off his family and the monarchy itself and announcing a tell-all biography which doubtless caused the Queen sleepless nights. America's top psychiatrist, Dr. Carol Lieberman, wasn't pulling her punches on my show on Friday when she said this. I think that she and Harry are responsible to some degree for the death of Prince Philip and the Queen. Because um, Prince Philip died, yes, he was, you know, of a certain age uh, and in getting in frail health, but he died a month after the Oprah interview. And then the Queen died in anticipation of this Netflix documentary and Harry's book. And I think that the stress, she broke their hearts. And that stress, I think, literally led to or at least contributed to their death. Now, I'm a big fan of Dr. Carol Lieberman, but I don't agree with her. However, I would say the mental anguish can't have been great for our late monarch in her final days. You could say that all of that is in the past, but the documentary that landed on Thursday, a documentary every minute of which has been signed off by this image conscious couple, featured a horrific scene in which Meghan mocked the fact that she bowed and curtsied to the Queen. Take a look. I mean, Americans will understand this. We have medieval times, dinner and tournament. It was like that. Like, I curtsied as though I was like... <laughs> Pleasure to meet you, Your Majesty. The look of shame is palpable. Sorry, folks, but that's the moment when Harry steps in and says, hey, that's my grandma you're talking about and one of the all-time greatest Britons. Instead, he smirked, looking like he wanted that 10 grand sofa to swallow him up. The fact that he would allow that dreadful moment to go into the film and air in front of the world tells you everything you need to know about Harry's family values. Throw Charles a bit of shade, no problem. But I'm sorry, this is my personal view, but you do not dare adulterate the memory of Queen Elizabeth II. And there's another family that this couple seem to struggle with, the community of nations known as the Commonwealth, which as a result of their one-sided history lesson 
to which we were subjected in this documentary is characterised as a sort of empire 2.0, even though the opposite is the case. The Commonwealth exists as a symbol of the end of empire, in which countries that we once occupied began a new relationship of solidarity, diplomacy and friendship. The Commonwealth is a wonderful, charitable endeavour. It provides nations around the world with fantastic economic opportunities, a global sporting event in the form of the Commonwealth Games, and untold cultural enhancements. It encourages mutual understanding between our different nations, reflecting on our shared history, the good, the bad, and yes, the ugly. And more importantly, it's about our shared future. Notwithstanding the many shocking and appalling crimes of empire, the Commonwealth represents the end of horrors like slavery and colonial rule. And that's why it's our proudest achievement. How many other empires, because of course we weren't the only one, boast enduring friendships and collaborations in the form of a voluntary club now made up of 54 nations? As Robert Hartman points out in the Daily Mail this week, Delegates from all over the world have been at Mansion House in the City of London for the Commonwealth Enterprise and Investment Council's latest trade summit on sustainable energy, food and resilience. Empire 2.0, eh? Hardman goes on to point out that the Commonwealth has acquired a new member, Gabon, a nation that was not even part of Britain's colonial footprint at all in its history. Do they think that the Commonwealth is Empire 2.0? It's also pretty patronising to paint a picture of these great global nations as pathetic, tragic victims of a Western superpower. I doubt they would share that view, otherwise they would have long ago rescinded their membership. I believe that the Commonwealth is the envy of the world and we shouldn't apologise for it. We should be growing it, investing in it and celebrating it. We should be shouting from the rooftops, Far from being something to feel bad about, the Commonwealth is an uncommon success.